Oh, hi, everyone, from my side. So um, give me a short introduction. So I'm Nico Meisenthal. I'm senior cloud DevOps consultant at WhiteDuck. Um, we are a company in southern Germany and near Munich. Um, I'm a Microsoft MVP, a Docker community leader, and GitLab hero. Um, and I'm doing stuff around Kubernetes, DevOps, uh, cloud, uh, mainly focused on, on Azure. Yeah, so what I will talk about today. Um, so first of all, I will talk about why do we need um, Kubernetes? Then how doing some minutes of how Kubernetes actually works, just some basics to get everyone on the same level. Uh, and we'll then talk about um, container services on Azure. So AKS and some others around. And then in the last part, if we have some time, um, we'll do a short demo. Cool, so let's start off. First of all, why do we need Kubernetes? So before we talk about Kubernetes, let's briefly talk about uh, containers itself. Um, so with containers, we have some kind of, of, of nice functionalities. Um, first of all, we have um, an isolation. So a container itself is not more than just an isolated process on our machine, so which allows us to run multiple processes next to each other on a single machine um, without any, any trouble, anything, dependencies between the, the, the processes each other. So this first one, isolation. Second one, um, dependencies. So with our container, which is just an isolated process, we get the opportunity to change the underlying file system, which is so-called um, container image. So we can provide a container image with our um, process. Um, the container uh, image itself includes everything the process needs. Could be an operating system, could just be some binaries um, and so on. So with this in place, we can define the dependencies of our process and make sure the dependencies are met. And then of course, scalability. Um, our process is complete completely isolated, um, all dependencies are within our process itself, our container. And with that, we are able to just scale out the container as we need them. Pretty nice so far. Um, and our last one, we, are, we, are, we have immutable uh, containers. Um, immutable containers uh, means, and this is once again related to the container image, um, that every instance we start, start um, will look the same. So we have a container image, which is basically our template we're creating a container instance from. Um, and this one is looking the same all the time. So if we start 10 instances, all the 10 containers will look the same. Um, so, but this immutable. So this are the main reasons why we should choose containers um, and love the container, uh, containerized microservice, uh, containerized applications. Yes, so, but um, with container, we also have some kind um, of issues or they're not yet production ready if we do just containers. Um, that's why we need something else which helps us bring the production level on top. So first of all, we need some need to manage those containers. Um, we might need to scale them. So we have the opportunity to scale them or automatically scale them and we need to monitor them. So if the process is running, do we need to restart the containers and so on. Um, then as example, um, once again, we somehow like to scale the containers. We would like to scale them across multiple nodes, um, which if we go for um, Docker Plane or Docker Compose, it's completely stricter to one node, to one machine only. Um, so we need something to scale out across multiple nodes. Um, if we scale out our container workload, we somehow need um, an option to do load balancing and service discovery. So think about we have 20 different um, containers running, and we need something in front to be able to yeah, load balance or provide a peer addresses, DNS entries, and so on to have service discovery in place. Um, then, of course, um, self healing. So we would like to know when a container process stopped working. Um, or had some issues or getting trouble, uh, we'd like to know this and maybe to automatically stop or kill the container and restart a new instance. And then um, last but not least, we somehow 
need any configuration management, secret management, uh, storage management if someone would like to get um, any kind of state. Um, yeah, so this are the main reasons why containers itself are not yet production ready and we need something on top. So and that's where Kubernetes comes to place. So Kubernetes itself is basically an open source um, system which helps you automating your deployment, deployments, uh, scaling your containers and, uh, and manage, um, manage them in any kind of, of reasons. And the important rent, uh, Kubernetes is doing this with a declarative approach. Now this basically means, um, and it's on the next slide, basically means that uh, Kubernetes, we tell Kubernetes what we would like to have and Kubernetes is doing it. So we are defining as uh, I described in the example with a, hey, Kubernetes, please run my application with three instances. And then Kubernetes will do everything needed to run those three instances. And we do not tell Kubernetes how to do it. We just say, hey, we'd like to have three instances of our app and Kubernetes is doing it. So uh, the last line, if one of the instance dies, um, Kubernetes, well, itself know it after some seconds because we have some kind of, uh, of monitoring in place and will then decide to kill the container and restart a new instance. So Kubernetes will make sure that every time uh, three instances are running. And it's nothing I need to do. Um, it's basically just, I think I would like to have the instances and Kubernetes will do, do so. Yeah, so some basic facts um, about Kubernetes. So first of all, Kubernetes, um, the word is Greek. Um, it basically means uh, help man, helms man or captain, which is pretty nice because a helps man is nearly doing the same like Kubernetes. So and, um, on, a, on a big ship, um, the helps man is not doing the actual work, just the helps man tells his crew or the autopilot or anything else to um, do the work or I tell I would, uh, would like to, to drive in this direction and the ship is doing the same. So um, Kubernetes was introduced by Google in June 2014. So it's some, some years old now. Um, and then after open sourcing it, it's, um, it's um, actually was hosted um, or provided to the Cloud Native Computing Foundation. Um, which is a, a part of the Linux Foundation um, to get a, a nice open source um, foundation. And then um, after providing uh, Kubernetes to the Cloud Native Computing Foundation, um, Microsoft, IBM, Red Hat, uh, and Docker joined the project um, six weeks after the first release. Um, and then um, one of the big players uh, contributing to, to Kubernetes. Uh, Kubernetes was not the first container management tool built by Google. There are two more, Borg and Omega, uh, which are both internally used at Google and not open sourced. And uh, Google itself decided instead of building a third one for their use cases, um, they decided to build uh, Kubernetes and provide it to the, uh, to the world out there. And yeah, to be honest, um, at the moment, Kubernetes is the only, well, the containerized orchestration tool. There are them other out there, but mostly all of the world is using Kubernetes so far. So um, let's switch over to, to the Kubernetes basics um, and learn about how Kubernetes works. Um, first of all, um, we have pod. So the smallest instance in our Kubernetes environment is a pod. Um, it's not a container. Um, that's very important. So a container um, itself can have um, a pod itself can have a container uh, in it uh, or multiple ones. So in this case, we have um, our main process, this one, which is really the container image we would like to run and we would like to define um, our main process or application. Um, and then we have some kind of uh, other containers around. So we have an um, init container on the left. The init container um, is used to provide um, yeah, basic functionalities 
in front of the main process. So you can define it in the container if you would like to, to do that stuff before the main process is started. So think about um, configure the environment, um, creating database tables and so on. Everything which your main process needs, but you don't like to have it on your main code. Um, really nice feature about in the container is that um, the in the container needs to finish successfully before the main container it gets started. Then on the other side, we have the so-called sidecar containers. Um, sidecar containers are containers which, which live next to your main process and allow you to, to add additional functionalities. So think about log management, log forwarding, or if we talk about um, a service mesh world, uh, most of all service meshes out there are putting their managed um, proxy um, as a sidecar next to your main process. So anything related to HTTP proxies or log management would live in a sidecar container. And then we have um, the network interface for the pod itself. Um, this one, just the IP address, the pod gets internal in the Kubernetes cluster to communicate with other services. And this one is actually also a container, um, which is just providing network interface and uh, mapping the IP address. So if you have the smallest possible um, pod, you will add, you will have the, the network container as well as the main container. And this is why the smallest instance is a pod and not a container. So um, then um, we are talking about the pod, or I had already talked about the pod with one or two or multiple containers in it. Um, now we would like to schedule um, our application itself and make sure that the application is running. So that's why we are not deploying just the pod configuration in our cluster. Um, if we do so, our application would run, and everything would be fine. But Kubernetes would make sure that the pod uh, gets restarted or scaled in any uh, in, in any kind of reason. So to do so, we need um, a resource called um, replica set. So this one here, and a replica set will then make sure that a pod is scheduled to the count we define. So if we define we would like to have four instances, the replica set will make sure that four instances are running all time. Um, to be 100% clear, it's not the replica set itself, um, it's the replica set controllers, and there are some kind of controllers, which is basically small microservices, which uh, uh, listen to the API and doing things. So in case of the replica controller, if a new replica resource is created or changed, the replica controller will um, review the resource and will define steps to do. So at least maybe schedule another pod because uh, one was killed or scale out because we changed the instance counter or things like that. So the replica set and the replica controller are making sure that our instances are made. And then around here, we have the deployment configuration. Um, the deployment configuration is mainly the part we are really acting with. So if you create or would like to, to deploy our app, we are most of the time um, deploying a deployment instead of a replica set or a pod. Um, why are we doing that? Um, mainly because the deployment adds an, an abstraction level on top of the replica sets. So if you think about um, upgrades, so you would like to to change to a newer image version or a completely new image, and you would like to do it without any downtime, um, this is where the deployment and deployment controller comes into place. So basically, if you have a deployment and you would like to upgrade it, um, you're defining a new tech version or image version, um, which then happens is that the deployment controller creates a second replica set. So we're getting two replica sets within our deployment. And within every replica set, um, pods are scheduled. So we have the old replica set with the old version of the pod and the containers, and we have the new replica set with the new pod and the new container image version. And then, um, at least if the default configuration is, is used, um, the new replica set is scaled up 
and the old replica set is scaled down. And if it's zero, the replica set itself will be deleted. And this is done to make sure that um, um, make sure that um, there's no downtime when upgrading um, our deployment. Now, this is the whole story about why we use deployments and not replica set to make sure we do have uh, online updates. So now we have our deployment running, which basically means we have our app running in five, four, three instances, but we somehow would like to communicate with other services. Um, this is where a cluster IP service comes to place, um, which is used for the internal communication. So I think about we have um, the pod up here, which is um, our service A. And then we have um, some other kind of pods which are scaled out um, with our application B. And if application A would like to talk to application B, um, the pod wouldn't directly talk to the uh, application B pod. Um, it would talk through a service. And this service is basically an IP address and uh, on DNS entry in our Kubernetes cluster, which is aware which pod is available um, and is able to get traffic. So if this pod is talking to this service, the service will make sure that the requests are routed to the pods which are basically available and able to uh, respond to the request. And this is how the whole internal communication is done. Um, but we maybe also would like to um, expose our uh, application to the internet, or at least to outside of our Kubernetes cluster. And this is where um, the NodePod service comes to place. Um, the NodePod service, um, it's some stuff on top, and it's basically um, exposes our application, our internal uh, service um, through high ports on every node. So in this example, we have um, two nodes. We have node one, node two, on, and every port, it doesn't matter if the application and the pod, the container itself is, is running on this node. Um, so it's on every node in the cluster, a uh, high port will be exposed to the outside. And this communication from this high port will then be routed through the internal service to our pods and containers. So this means I'm the user from the outside of this node would now be able to access um, the application using the high port um, and will get routed um, to the actual pod. Um, this, of course, not pretty nice. Um, in a normal world, you would then um, put a load balancer or proxy in front um, to get rid of the high ports, to get load balancing and stuff like this. Um, so this is why we in the Azure world um, or in any cloud world, we normally do not use uh, the NodePod service, but it's the basic underlying stuff um, which we are using um, in the next example. So if you're using Azure, um, you're basically using the load balancer service to export your services. And the load balancer service is the same like um, the node port, as I mentioned here. So it also exposes the high ports to the outside world. But then instead of getting me the opportunity to, to manually, manually adding uh, um, any kind of load balancer or proxy, um, Kubernetes itself will talk to the Azure Resource Manager and will register a load, Azure Load Balancer um, and automatically configure it. So if you're creating a Load Balancer service within our Kubernetes cluster, Kubernetes will talk to Azure and will request the Load Balancer, which gets automatically configured. So then this Load Balancer is listened to AT um, and 443 and then routing the request to the nodes on the high port, and this one gets then routed to the cluster to the actual pod and container. Um, now, this is the actual um, opportunity to, to um, export any kind of um, application. And this works with a um, load balancer and an external IP, uh, public IP as well as an internal load balancer, which is uh, located within a subnet or uh, your internal unit. Then on top, um, we have a so-called ingress uh, resource, which actually isn't a real, uh, a real service. Um, it's basically 
an um, HTTP proxy, which is listen on a load balancer port. So once again, we have our load balancer, but then our with Ingress, our traffic is not directly routed um, to our application. It's routed to uh, any kind of HTTP proxy. Uh, if you deploy the default configuration, it's Nginx, but any kind of uh, proxy is possible here. So would be also possible to add uh, Azure Application Gateway uh, in this case. And then with this, you have between your load balancer and your actually application, you have an HTTP proxy, which you then can use to um, redirect traffic. Um, like in this case, I have foodomain.com, which is redirected to service A, then I have domain.com slash foo, which is directed to other service, and then I have a wildcard, uh, which is redirected to uh, a third service. Um, which is also possible with an inquiries is to, uh, to define TLS, um, which then means you can add and um, terminate TLS at the inquiries level and also add certificates, um, which are managed by Kubernetes, which is once again pretty uh, pretty nice. So load balancer is used to expose one single application. Ingress is used to expose multiple applications and they have multiple options and in, in rewriting and all that stuff. Yeah, then um, the big picture um, for Kubernetes. So we have once again on the on the upper side, we have our master um, nodes and below we have our worker nodes. Um, in Azure world, the master node is completely managed. So we don't need to care about anything. You just get your API server address, which you can talk to, to talk to the API, get, um, get your resources, create resources. Um, and then everything else is uh, completely managed for you. Um, in the API, in the master server, we have the controller management uh, manager, like I said, the, those controller, um, listen to the API and doing stuff like the deployment controller, replica set controller, and so on. We have the scheduler, which is scheduling our pod. So scheduler is deciding when a pod is scheduled on which node it should get started. Um, and we have etcd as our persistent storage. So it's a, a key value database where the API server um, stores the state. This is the master node. On the uh, worker node side, we have multiple workers, which basically means multiple virtual machines, where our actually workload is located. So here are pods, pods scheduled and running, and we have some um, further smaller stuff. We have the group kubelet, which is basically um, the communication to the API server, which then actually schedules um, the containers and pods on the local machine. We have C advisor, which is uh, collecting metrics and forwarding them to API server, and we have group proxy, which is used um, for the actually exposing on the node that user is then able to um, to access um, the node itself. Yeah, so um, resources, like I said, deployment, replica sets, pods, and all the other ones um, are defined in YAML or JSON um, and use a declarative approach. Uh, as an example here, um, on the right side, we have a deployment and we define you would like to run one replica um, based on the image engine X. Um, in this case, the latest, because I did not add an image tag. Um, and this is it. So if we would like to scale up um, manually, we would just change the replica to four or five stakes, and then the API server um, or, or Kubernetes itself would, uh, would scale up and um, run new container instances. So um, when we create such a configuration, we first of all need to create it locally or use a CLI, which I talk in the next slide. Um, this YAML or JSON definition is then um, passed to the API server, which is validating it and then processing it and storing it in the in the state store. And then the controllers are acting on it. So if I save um, deployment configuration, the API server will not do anything else and validate it and then store it. And then the controllers 
would start working on it. So the deployment controller would say, yeah, okay, deployment, I need to create a replica set. And then the replica set would create the pods and so on. Yeah, so how do I work with Kubernetes? Um, first of all, um, we have a nice CLI, which is Kube CTL, Kube Cuttle. Um, there are different names for it. Um, and this one is used to do at least anything. I, um, it's available for Windows, Mac, and Linux. I can get, create, and delete resources. I can access any kind of API resources and details. Um, I can, can use kubectl to attach into a container if I'd like to debug um, the container. I can use port forwarding, so I can forward a container port locally on my machine that I can access the container port with, with localhost and attach a debugger or, or things like this. Um, and it's extensible, so if I would like to, to include plugins or write more plugins, I can do so. Um, then, of course, there's a dashboard. Um, it's this one on the right corner, um, which I can use if I would like to have a graphical interface. And then there are multiple and thousands uh, tools which have me working with Kubernetes resources or deploying Kubernetes resources, as example, um, would he would be Helm or customize to chat me with, with deployments, but it's a completely different story. Yeah, so this are the somehow container basics. So let's talk about um, how containers uh, work on Azure. So with the different um, services on Azure, first of all, is the Azure Container Registry, RCR. RC um, which is a full managed and scalable container registry. So once again, completely managed. Um, we have integrated security, so we can um, use our Azure AD credentials to authenticate and then can define well-based access. So who is allowed to do what, um, read images, push images, delete images, and so on. Um, Azure Container Registry is also able to build containers. So you don't need to build them locally and then push them into the registry. You can tell a container uh, registry to build them for you. Um, this can be done via Azure CLI. So you can do a, use Azure CLI on your local machine um, using the same syntax we, uh, as we use for Docker build. Uh, just do a ACID, RC, uh, RCR uh, build, uh, providing your Docker file, um, your working directory. And then your whole code is uploaded into the Azure Container Registry, and your container image is scheduled, um, uh, is built in the cloud. Um, Azure Container Registry also supports OCI images, which basically means that you are not only able to store container images, but also store some other kind of stuff. As an example, Helm Charts. Um, Helm is an um, application management tool which allows you to to build customizable and shareable deployments. And you can also share service using the container registry. Um, the pricing itself is based on the service tier and your usage. Um, so it depends and it's um, also fully integrated with, with Azure DevOps. Yeah, some, some more examples. Um, Azure Container Registry is also able to um, do image scanning. So with the premium um, service tier, you are able to test or, and security scan your images after building them. Um, but there are also uh, third party options which could be integrated. So you, with this, you can make sure that your um, container image does not have any security issues before um, using it and deploying it into your um, into your clusters. Then, of course, gear replication, um, which means you can access your Azure, uh, Azure Container Registry from different locations and, and always use the nearest location nearby, uh, the fastest location to, to get your images and, and, and work with them. So in this example, um, in Europe, um, you would access a data center in Europe, get your image, and then can use your uh, continuous delivery pipeline and deploy it into your AKS cluster. So um, this was container registry. Then we have container instances. Um, container instances are a lightweight option to run containers in Azure, 
without thinking about anything except your container image itself. Um, so it's basically means it's somehow a serverless um, service. You're just providing your container image, defining how you would like to scale it and run it. And you do not need to think about it anymore. So it supports Linux, Windows, and GPU workload, and it's, it's, it's perfectly used for any kind of red driven applications. So if you like to need to scale something um, on, a, on an event, you can use container instances um, or for some kind of batch job, data processing jobs, nightly jobs, so anything which just runs for one jobs and then needs, um, needs to be stopped, Azure container instances would be, would be a nice option. Which is also pretty nice um, is that container instances can be integrated with Azure Kubernetes service. Um, this is something I will talk later in detail, but basically for faster scaling or compute isolation. Um, yeah, and then um, Azure container instances are pay as you go um, based on CPU and memory usage. So Azure Kubernetes service itself, um, I think it's one of the mostly uh, or biggest uh, services in Azure and must be used uh, services. Um, it's a fully managed Kubernetes cluster. As of that in, uh, on the big picture of Kubernetes, um, the master nodes are completely managed. You don't need to think about them. You don't need to do anything. Um, Azure Kubernetes service is scalable and secure by default. Um, also runs Linux, Windows, and GPU workload. Um, and allows a nice end-to-end -end developer integration. So we have a tool uh, or function like Azure DevSpaces, which allows you to completely remove your development in a life cycle um, into Kubernetes. So instead of building and debugging lo locally, you can build and, and, and debug your application in your inner loop um, in a Kubernetes cluster with different um, options. Yeah, and then we have uh, Visual Studio Code integration, uh, pretty nice. So it's it, it's really nice integrated. Um, pricing is based on your compute, so just paying for your worker nodes, not the master node. And for your worker nodes, it's just a virtual machine, so you need to to pay this kind of virtual machine. So um, Azure Kubernetes service integrates perfectly with the whole Azure world, so we can use Azure Monitor for monitoring. Um, there's a um, um, a container solution, which is called Container Insights, which gives you uh, deep insights on your containers. You can integrate it with Azure Policy for governance, um, Azure Files, Azure Disks for persistent storage, Active Directory authentication um, for authentication and authorization. You can integrate AKS in your virtual network. Um, you can use Application Gateway for encrypt security, Key Vault to store your secrets can integrate it with, with Azure DevOps for CICD, and also it's, of course, integrated in the Azure portal for easy administration um, and um, easy access. But let's, just as an overview, let's uh, jump in, in some of the examples with some more details. So one um, would be Azure AD and the role-based access control behind it. So with uh, AKS, can um, authenticate with your Azure ID user. So you're just authenticating using, using the Azure CLI um, and then getting a token that is mentioned here. So you're authenticating and then getting a token back. And with this token, you then can access um, your Kubernetes cluster via kubectl, via dashboard, um, and so on. And then when you're authorized um, and able to access your Kubernetes cluster, you can then define roles within the cluster and map those to the Azure, Azure Director user or, or group. And then you can tell, okay, my group should have right access to all deployments in our cluster and so on. So you define who, which resource, and um, what, um, the user is allowed to um, to do. So pretty nice um, integration with Azure AD. Then we have cluster autoscaler and virtual nodes. So let's focus on the left side. Um, it's um, cluster autoscaler. 
especially in mean you have your uh, Azure Kubernetes service running and you have, let's say, one pod, uh, one node running, um, and you would like to, to scale out your pods, but you don't have enough uh, compute to do so, then those pods uh, would be scheduled, but never st uh, um, started, so they would um, would still be pending because there's no compute where the pods can be can be started. Then the cluster autoscaler could scale up um, our AKS cluster, um, which basically would add a new virtual machine, would add the virtual machine to the uh, virtual machine uh, scale set, and integrate it in our Kubernetes cluster. And with this in place, we would then have enough uh, compute to um, to run or schedule the new pods. Um, pretty nice option to, to scale out, but it took some time. So it's basically requesting a new VM and adding this new VM into our cluster, which can take one, two, three, four, five minutes, depending, depending on the time. Um, so this is where virtual nodes comes in place. So virtual node, the thing I mentioned before, with Azure Container Instances, and virtual node allows us to um, integrate Azure Container Instances with our Kubernetes cluster, which then mean we could scale into our virtual node, which means Azure Container Instances, and scale out there, which then is just the, a scale out of seconds. So if you have a peak in your, in your application and would like to scale out in seconds, you can do with Azure Container Instances. Um, with a, a normal cluster autoscaler, you would sc scale after the peak already finished. So you have those different kind of options. Then, of course, um, there's the option to use a private cluster, um, which means um, normally your API, a Kubernetes API endpoint is exposed on a public IP. This can be changed via um, the private link feature to map or expose this uh, API endpoint into an internal subnet. And the same for your services. If you expose the service, normally it's a um, load balancer with some, it then gets a public IP, but it's also possible to expose the service using an internal load balancer, which then can be mapped in one of your um, subnets. So it can be configured to be totally private. Uh, same for any kind of um, other platform as a service um, services in Azure. So if you would like to have a container registry privately within the same subnet as your Kubernetes cluster, you can do so. And also with um, with storage services like Azure Files or um, SQL or anything else, or Cosmos DB. Then I already mentioned it. Um, there's a container inside solution, which can be added to log analytics and then used with Azure Monitor, uh, which provides you with deep insights um, on, um, on your containers and your Kubernetes cluster. So also a um, uh, pretty nice, nice feature to get um, all the monitoring metrics details you, you need. And then you can use it, as you know, with log analytics, with Azure Monitor, alerting, and so on. There's also an option to uh, to add um, your own metrics using a Prometheus integration if you would like to. So then um, we can also integrate Azure policies for governance reasons. So it's um, it's possible to decide Azure policies, but then um, affect your AKS cluster. Think about you would like to only allow a certain container uh, registries or trusted container registry and make sure that no Docker images, uh, container images are, are, are pulled from Docker Hub. You can either lock down the egress of your AKA cluster to, to permit it on network level, but you can also use Azure policies and only allow certain um, container images, container tags, container registries. Uh, and then once again, uh, in background, there's a controller which then checks every deployment and decide whether it, it's allowed to scale it or, or not. Yeah, then um, another security feature is the integration of Azure Key Vault. So you can use Azure Key Vault to, um, to store your secrets and then use those secrets in your, um, in your container. Um, Basically, this is an integration which needs, which needs to be set up before you can use it, but then you can inject 
um, your secrets or your keys using either files or environment variables into your container and then use it. And so you don't need any kind of, uh, of secrets to configure it. So it's um, a pretty nice and secure way to inject your, um, your secrets. So there's also um, from Kubernetes side, um, this is a called secret, which allows you to store secrets, but it's not 100% secure. So it's best practice to use any kind of, of key vaults and that lets you get a nice integration of Azure Key Vault. So it's perfectly and, and, and pretty nice and secure. Yeah, and uh, last thing is Azure AD pod identity, um, which is a little bit bigger and complex thing, but uh, basically uh, Azure AD pod identity allows your container to authenticate with other Azure services. So let's say you have your application and your application needs to talk to a SQL server. Then normally you would need to provide the secret into the container. And then the container has the secret to talk to the and authenticate against the Azure SQL um, server and then talk to it. With Azure Active Directory pod identity, the pod itself is authenticated and allowed to talk to Azure SQL Server. So you don't need to add any authentication within your um, application code. It, the, the authentication is done on a pod level. Um, so the pod is allowed to talk to the Azure SQL, uh, SQL Server and you, need to, you don't need to do anything related to security um, on your own. So it's a pretty nice feature. In the background, it's, it's based on not managed identities if you know them with virtual machines and so on. So it's basically the same plus, uh, but it's, it's added to a next level on the, um, uh, on the pod level. So pretty nice feature, a um, little bit complex to set up in the first tries, but if you have it running, it's, it's, it's really nice and uh, abstracts all the um, security and authentication stuff with uh, error services, so pretty nice. So then as a last point, I would have a short demo, but I think we are already um, pretty late and have only three minutes left. So I think I would skip this one <laughs> and uh, open up for questions. So also um, slides are already published. So uh, if you'd like to get slides uh, uploaded to SlideShare, uh, but you can also review um, this session on YouTube. So do we have any questions? Uh, yes, we have. First of all, thank you very much for a very interesting session, uh, Nico. Uh, okay. We have one question, and I think that's also a good one to follow up uh, on this session as well. And that is, where is the best place to start with learning AKS for someone who is new to AKS? Okay, so for AKS itself, I would go to the Azure documentation. So there are pretty nice examples um, which you can use um, at trial. Uh, maybe also the Kubernetes documentation itself. On Kubernetes, they all, if you would like to, to learn more about Kubernetes itself, so those posts would be helpful, I guess. <laughs>